All right, good morning. How is everyone? Good. I'm glad you're here. Grateful to see you. Thanks for choosing to worship with us. Uh, All of you that are joining us online today, really grateful that you're here. We're continuing our series in Revelation. We're doing 14 weeks in the book of Revelation, breaking that into like three mini-series. And the first part of that is the message to the churches. So today we're going to be in Revelation chapter 2, 18 to 29. If you need a Bible, there's one in the chair in front of you. Uh, I'd really love you to be able to to see it and take it home take it home with you if you need that Bible take it take it home with you. Um, so this is interesting when you come to Revelation when you come to the book of Revelation people have all kinds of crazy ideas about Revelation. Have you heard any of those ideas lately like in the last you know 6 months the last 6 weeks yesterday even in fact. And so Uh, Here's the deal. Revelation is not uh, a code to be cracked. It has a historical context, a local context that was meant uh, for these churches that we're going to be talking about this one particular even today. But it also has an apocalyptic prophetic trajectory, meaning there was a local meaning, but also a futuristic trajectory. All right. And it's way less crazy than people make it out to be. Some of it is difficult to understand, but we have a lot of theories that don't really match the biblical text. And so today we're going to look at particularly the church at Thyatira uh, as we continue this uh, study. I want to read you this verse before we get into the major, major section of scripture. And I, I want to go through some context. So Paul wrote to the Ephesians, which the church at Ephesus is is the first of the the seven churches uh, in this section of Scripture and Revelation. We didn't go over Ephesus, uh, but but you could go back and read that letter today. We're only going to do three of the seven in our, our, our particular series. But Paul wrote to Ephesus this in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 to 10. He said, for by grace you have been saved through faith. That's really good news, right? For by grace, you've been saved through faith. So this is not something that uh, you earned, this salvation, but it's given to you by the grace of God through your faith in him, through your belief in him. And this is not your own doing, Paul says. It is the gift of God, not a result of work, so that no one may boast. Now, here's the part we need to sort of hold on to for today. For we are his workmanship. Created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in him, walk in them. When you come to Thyatira and this section of scripture, this letter from Jesus to the church at Thyatira, what you find is that this issue of works or deeds is mentioned five times in the letter. And one of the sort of underlying themes here are why do our works and deeds matter to Jesus? It's not for our salvation because by grace we've been saved through faith. But our works and deeds do matter. Now let me give you some historical context. I have a laser pointer, which I I can't handle these. These are like, I'm like a fifth grader with a laser pointer. So... I'm going to put this on the floor after I'm done so I'm not tempted like Roy Beatty right there. Bing! See how that works? All right. So this is, uh, this is the, the pathway, the trade route for the seven churches of Revelation. The reason that I show you this, we were just reading about Ephesus, which is right there. We talked about uh, Smyrna. The next one would be Sardis. And today we're in Thyatira. And Thyatira is a real place. That's why I want you to see the map. This is not made up. This is not some like, you know, hocus pocus sort of revelatory craziness. But this is a real place called Thyatira on a trade route between Pergamum and Sardis. Now, I'm going to put the laser pointer down. Sorry, Roy. Uh, so, <clears throat> Thyatira in fact, if, you, if we thought about Ephesus and Smyrna as these really rich, opulent towns, Thyatira is more blue collar. So it's artisan, it's craftsmen, it is, it is serving uh, the rich. It's kind of like a middle class town. And in that town, the, uh, the thing that they are known for particularly is a dye, a purple dye. 
Um, it's called Turkish red today, but in, in the, the text, it just calls, a, it, calls it a, a purple dye. And there's some biblical history that I think you should think about just as we come to Thyatira. And that is, uh, there is a woman that Paul meets in a place called Philippi. She's from Thyatira, and her name is Lydia. And Lydia is really important. I'll just read one section of scripture of Acts 16, 14 to 15. It says, uh, <clears throat> Uh, a, there was a woman named Lydia from the city of Thyatira, a seller of purple goods, who was a worshiper of God. So she's from Thyatira. It's no, no. Uh, um, it's obvious. It's obvious that she would be selling purple goods. They're known for that in Thyatira. She was a worshiper of God. The Lord opened her heart to pay attention to what was said by Paul, and after she was baptized in her household as well, and she urged us, saying, "If you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord." come to my house and stay, and she prevailed upon us. So Paul actually came to Lydia's house in Thyatira, and we believe Lydia was instrumental in starting uh, what became uh, an extension, planting churches in, in that particular region. And so important, important background. Uh, also, the religion in Thyatira, the believe it or not, was was not Christian. That was not the prevalent religion of the day, although we kind of look at Revelation and hear Thyatira and think it must have been. But the worship of Apollo was the big deal in Thyatira at the time that this particular letter is written. Uh, Apollo is uh, the sun god or the god of light. He's the son of Zeus in mythology. So he's the son of the most high god in, in mythology. He uh, is, he's got a twin sister named Artemis, and Artemis is also a big deal in that particular region, but not in uh, Thyatira. Uh, you'll need that in a minute because Apollo is uh, mixed with imperial cult worship or the worship of Caesar, and they see Caesar as Apollo incarnate, the son of God walking the planet, okay? That's important for us to understand about Thyatira. In Thyatira, there are trade guilds. So you got all these workers, bronze workers, leather workers, purple dye uh, people, you know, linen guilds. So for every one of these trades, there is a guild. And the guild is important for us to understand because the guild, in order to be in the guild, you had to compromise and fall in line with the order of the guild. So each guild had a particular patron, god or goddess. So if you're a a bronze worker, let's say, uh, the patron guild of of, uh, that might be Apollo, And so we have to worship Apollo to be in that guild. And with each one of these guilds, they're politically engaged, they're socially engaged in the town. And with these uh, political and social engagements to be in the guild, you had to participate in these parties. And these parties were uh, less than biblical, let's say. Uh, They are, are awful. You know, I look around and see a kid here or there, and it makes me want to stop describing how these parties are because um, it is, it is I'm going to say, sexually awful. Everything against what the scripture would say is right in that particular category. And that's what's going on in these guilds. So let me give you an example. Let's say I'm a bronze worker in Thyatira. And I have a wife and I have three kids and I got to put food on the table. The best way for me to make money is to be in a guild because the guilds control prices, they network, they get you work. work. And so in order to be in the guild, what am I going to have to do if I'm, a, if I'm a, a believer in Christ, a follower of Jesus, Jesus is Lord, I'm going to have to compromise. I'm going to have to tolerate this whole guild thing, and I'm going to have to participate in the worship to its patron god or goddess. I'm going to have to participate in its politics. I'm going to have to participate in its, its parties, for lack of a better term and pay into it. It's also, I mean, those guilds are, are amazing because they took care of you. So there was no like Blue Cross, Blue Shield, but if you got injured on the job, they paid you if you're in a, if you're in a guild. But if you're not in a guild, you're on your own. If you're not in a guild, it, it wasn't like required, but if you're not in a guild, you're just not gonna get work. You know, you're just not gonna have the, the work, and this is a problem. 
So that is running through Thyatira uh, as we come to this letter. And by the way, <clears throat> these parties, they sacrifice food to idols. So there's also very gluttonous. Like there's stories of like they eat so much at these parties and then, and then throw up afterwards so they can eat more. And it's all food that they've sacrificed to idols. So go Romans, right? Mm. It's awful, but, but, but at the same time, not uncommon. One layer below the surface. Okay, so now let's do this. Let's stand and read this letter with that kind of in mind, with all that backdrop. Revelation chapter 2, 18 to 29. And we say this phrase, the very words at the end of the main text reading, just to distinguish God's word from my own. Here's what it says. And to the angel of the church in Thyatira write, the words of the son of God who has eyes like a flame of fire and whose feet are burnished bronze. I know your works and your love and faith and service and patient endurance and that your latter works exceed the first. But I have this against you, that you tolerate that woman Jezebel who calls herself a prophetess and is teaching and seducing my servants to practice sexual immorality and to eat food sacrificed to idols. I, give her time to, I gave her time to repent, but she refuses to repent of her sexual immorality. Behold, I will throw her onto a sickbed, and those who commit adultery with her, I will throw her throw into great tribulation unless they repent of her works, and I will strike her children dead, and all the churches will know that I am he who searches mind and heart, and I will give to each of you according to your works. But to the rest of you in Thyatira, who do not hold this teaching, who have not learned what some call the deep things of Satan, to you, I say, I do not lay on you any other burden. Only hold fast what you have until I come. The one who conquers and who keeps my works until the end, to him I will give authority over the nations. And he will rule them with a rod of iron as, with, when, as when earthen pots are broken in pieces, even as I myself have received authority from my father. And I will give him the morning star. He who has ear, and ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. You can be seated. Now, each of these letters is broken down into a particular pattern, and the pattern is the same pretty much with each letter. And the first part of that pattern is a statement of revelation or introduction. Jesus introduces himself as the, right, as the author of the letter, the author, the speaker of the message, and he introduces himself to, to each town, each city in a particular way that they need to hear. So here in Revelation chapter 2 verses 18, he says, this is the words of the Son of God. And this is the only time in the book of Revelation that title is used. It's because because Apollo is worshiped there, and it is in the face of the Son of God, Apollo, that Jesus is saying, I am the Son of God. He's described as having eyes like flames of fire, and, and Apollo is the God of sun and light. He has feet like burnished bronze, bright, celebrating his strength and splendor, all of it in contrast to Apollo. So Apollo says he's the Son of God. I'm really the Son of God. That's how he's introduced. Now, one scholar, Batcher, says this, with such eyes, these eyes like flames of fire, with such eyes, the Son of God can see into the most distant and darkest places. With such feet, he can stamp out all opposition to his rule. Like this is the, this is the, the message behind this introduction. Now, I am way more powerful and way more capable than Apollo, I am the son of God, eyes like flames of fire, feet like burnished bronze. Daniel in a dream, in a vision, in Daniel chapter 10 verse 6 describes uh, the, the ancients of days, Jesus, who he's seeing in a vision. He says his body was like beryl, his face 
like the appearance of lightning, his eyes like flaming torches and his arms and legs like the gleam of burnished bronze and the sound of his words like a, a multitude. Daniel is just, John is just echoing what Daniel saw. They, they, they uh, see this Jesus as strong and powerful and the light of the world and the living son of God. Now, here's how Jesus starts, and we, and we work into what is the second section of this letter. This is kind of a statement of commendation or affirmation. It begins in 219, and, and what we see is that he says, first and foremost, I know your works. Some translation will say, I know your deeds, and he starts with commendation or affirmation about their deeds. He knows their love and their faith. So he's looking at this church at Thyatira and he's affirming the love and the faith that he sees in the body of Christ at Thyatira. And that's a good thing. Uh, This is their motive. The motive of their heart is right. It's the love of God and the love of people. Their faith, they're fixed on Jesus, the author and perfecter of their faith. Their, their, Their motive is right. But he also says, and 219, that I recognize and affirm your service and your patient endurance and that your latter works are even greater than, than at first. So that he's saying, look, when the church started, you did good things, but as the church has grown, matured spiritually, it, it does even greater works of service. It, it, it's gotten uh, more influential, more impactful in the culture, and it carries the banner of my love and my grace uh, sufficiently. And so this is the affirmation that the church gets. It's full of love and full of faith, and it serves really, really well. But unlike uh, Smyrna that we talked about last week, Thyatira gets a strong statement of criticism from Jesus, and it's found in Revelation 2, 20 to 23. And I want to explain this because I think it's important for us to understand uh, historically, but also for application as we think about our own church. So in verse 20, it says, but I have this against you that you tolerate that woman Jezebel who calls herself a prophetess and is teaching and seducing my servants to practice sexual immorality and to eat food sacrificed to idols. So what is going on here? Is there a real woman named Jezebel? I don't think so. I think this is a metaphor and I think it's pointing back to the Old Testament about a Baal priestess named Jezebel who brought with her into the people of Israel in that time a Baalism with hypersexuality that permeated the culture. And, and, you know, God was constantly saying, don't worship other idols. This was the king of Israel marrying this, this lady named Jezebel who brought Baalism from the top and all that. Everything was wrong about it. And now he's saying to the church at Thyatira, there is a woman who is like Jezebel, who is, is, is pervasive in a false teaching. And that false teaching relates to sexual immorality and eating food sacrificed to idols. The indication is that this lady is saying in the church, teaching in the church, that it's okay to participate in the works of the guild if you need to put food on your table. Because the guild requires uh, food, you eating food sacrificed to idols. The, the guild requires sexual immorality. So it's an issue of tolerating false teaching. Now, why would anybody tolerate false teaching in the context of the church? Jesus doesn't apparently. He has this against them. Why would you tolerate that? You would tolerate it because it makes it more easy to live. Let me think, you think about that for just a minute. Like if I, I got three kids, I got to put food on the table. Wouldn't I be happy if there was someone in our church or some influence saying, it's okay to go be in that guild. If your motive is to put your food, food on the table, go ahead and participate and just walk in the grace of God. Do the sexual immorality. Do, 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 do the food sacrifice to idols. 
It's okay. Your mode, it's not like you're, you're loving that, enjoying that. It's just you have to do it in order to put food on the table. And so they tolerate this false teaching in order to put food on the table. It's for economy, right? So that, that our, family, our family can survive. Now, Jesus says of this that I will judge her and her followers. I mean, if you, if you look at this language, it is, this is not Jesus loves me. This I know for the Bible tells me so. This is like, I gave her time to repent. So that verse 21, I gave her time to repent. That's, that tells us the heart of Jesus. He's saying, look, I gave her time to turn around. It's not like he's just like lightning bolts from heaven. Apparently he convicted, he gave time. She hasn't, hasn't changed. I gave her time to repent, but she refuses to repent of her sexual immorality. So here's the judgment. Behold, I will throw her onto a sick bed, and those who commit adultery with her, I will throw into great tribulation unless they repent of her works. And I will strike her children dead, and all the churches will know that I am he who searches the mind and the heart, and I will give to each of you according to your works. This is the works, 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 works. So for some reason, in the eyes of Jesus, the works of the people in the church of Thyatira really matter. And this, this lady has brought in this false teaching. And the church has tolerated. And this is the, this is the sin of, of, of the church of Thyatira is the toleration of false teaching. Now, remember what he affirmed them for. Great love, faith, service. Do you know that you can have great love, that you can be really good at serving, but if you have bad doctrine, you do not reflect the church of Jesus Christ. You got it? Spirit and truth go together. It's for the love, we love God and love people with all our heart, our mind, our soul, our strength. We love people, we love our neighbor as ourselves, but we do that in the framework of biblical doctrine. And we can't deviate from that. The sin of Thyatira is the sin of tolerance, which may fall on, you know, like weird. It may sound weird to us because we think of the word tolerance and we have all kinds of lenses for which we look at that particular word. Today, in fact, the only universally recognized sin in our culture is intolerance. And so we have these ideas of, well, what this, is this a political word? Is it a theological word? What is this word? Tolerance. I begin to think about that because, like, uh, like uh, here's what I know about any crowd of evangelical Christians is that you, you uh, hopefully we have a biblical lens that we're looking through, but all of you come from different angles, backgrounds, experiences, and, and ideas. Um, you will hear through your lens. And so I want to be very clear about uh, what I'm saying related to tolerance today. It relates in this passage to false teaching. What false teaching do we tolerate as the church of Jesus Christ in America? What false teaching do we tolerate that leads to actions, behavior, rhetoric, deeds that Jesus can't tolerate? What is it? I, I thought of a bunch. I made a long list and we have not time to go through the entire list. And, and I will say that I'm, I'm looking generally at the church in America, not necessarily just this church, but there are three that I think that we, we have a tendency to embrace as the church of Jesus Christ in America. The first one is this, and it's not unlike the teaching that uh, Thyatira is getting from this prophetess. We have a lot of false teaching related to sexuality and identity, a lot now, here's the deal. We are all created in the image of God. It's very clear. There's not one person walking the planet that is not created in the image of God. And on that level, you know, we can love anyone because they're created in the image of God. Secondarily, when it comes to sexuality, we are redefining that in our culture, and now our churches are redefining sexuality. 
and so much so that we become affirming churches, right? Now, here's the thing. According to the scripture, I can love anyone who's struggling with identity. I can love anyone who's struggling with any kind of sexual sin. But I can't affirm sexual sin in the church. I can't say it's okay for you to do that because the Bible doesn't say it's okay for us to do that. There's no way to affirm it biblically. And so while we'll never be an affirming church as the word is used in the context of our our culture in the United States of America, hopefully we're a loving church to everyone created in the image of God, but we can't affirm sexual sin. But churches all over the United States do this. This is a false teaching that we give into, and we can't. The second one, I think, is a false teaching related to, that one's easy for this church to grasp. The second one is a little bit harder. The second one is a false teaching related to nationalism. So this, I have lost more friends over this one conversation in two years than any other conversation. It's terrible, you know, terrible conversation to have. And he, but here's why we should have it. A false teaching related to nationalism So if false teaching related to sexuality and identity are affirming churches, false teaching related to nationalism are God and country churches. So we can love our country. We should love our country. I'm really grateful to live in the United States of America. But we can't love it so much that we try to make the kingdom of God work for it. We can't turn the funnel upside down and somehow say, you know, uh, that, that this nation, this sovereign nation, this, this empire, it, this republic is the most important thing. For the church of Jesus Christ, it would be opposite of, of that. We're just one nation among many. Our focus is King Jesus and his kingdom. We pray, may his kingdom come and his will be done on earth as it is in heaven in this country and all over the world. You see, and sometimes the churches in the United States of America, particularly in the last two years, have gotten this uh, confused. Our hope is never in a politician or a pundit, it's always in Jesus. Uh, I pray for the, the, the United States of America, but my hope is not in the United States of America. I seek first the kingdom of God. You see, one time I wrote a blog, it's been like 10 years ago now, eight nine, 10 years ago now. It's called Why We Don't Sing Patriotic Music in Church. That one, that one got me. I mean, people hated me for a moment until they forgot about it. And I'm bringing it back up now, which is probably not a good idea. Um, but they ha- hated it. Why? Because we, I said, look, the, the church for this one hour time frame, this is in Christ alone. See, It's not un-American, it's kingdom first. It's Jesus first, see? That's why we don't have flags on our stage. That's why we don't sing patriotic songs in these works. That's intentional. Propaganda in the Roman Empire, it uses religion to push a Roman doctrine. It uses sport to push a Roman doctrine. I'm gonna mess with you now. Why do we sing the national anthem before sports? You ever thought about that? Like, it seems good. It seems right. Everybody loves to do it. I, I love to do it. But why do we do it? It's Roman. It's a Roman idea. It's a Roman idea that you use sport, religion, and a couple other theater and all those kinds of things to push a Roman doctrine. And that's the same thing that, that we do. So false teaching related to national. These are God and country churches. And, and we can't be that either because we have to seek first the kingdom of God. But that one creeps in. And in Texas, that one creeps in in a big way. Here's the third one. And last one that I'll talk about today is a false teaching related to humanism. False teaching related to humanism. This is like self-oriented churches. So if, if we have affirming churches and we have God and country churches, we also have these self-centered, self-oriented churches that basically boast a health and wealth gospel. The only thing you kind of get in there is God is for you. 
but you don't learn that there's this whole meta-narrative from Genesis to Revelation that says God is living for the glory of God and the restoration of all things, and that might include your soul, but you're just one small part of it. It's not like when you accept Jesus, you should get rich. When you accept Jesus, you should never be sick. When you uh, confess Christ, everything will be okay. But there are churches that preach that, particularly in the United States of America, in, the big t- in a big way in this particular city, and that is false teaching. The church of Jesus Christ is a bl- blessing, but it's not designed with me at the center or you at the center. Its center is King Jesus. Its mission is primary because it's Jesus's mission, and that's the mission we should be on. I I would go so far as to say the the church that worships self worships Satan because your eyes are off the king. He's worked his, the enemy has worked his trick really well in that particular case. So the church at Thyatira, its sin is the sin of false teaching. It's the sin of tolerating false teaching teaching. Now there is a statement of command, Revelation chapter 2, 24 to 25, it says, uh, to all of you who have not bought into the false teaching, I hope that's the majority of us in this room, to all of you watching online, I hope that's the majority of you, to all of you who have not bought into the false teaching, hold fast. I'm not, he says, I'm not going to put any other burden on you. Hold fast. Walk in the works that I've created you to do. Keep loving. Keep serving. Hold fast to good doctrine. There's a statement of promise. If you do that, if you conquer, verse 26 to 29, conquering means keeping my works to the end. So if Jesus too said he created us, but beforehand, it created us for, for, for good works, and we should walk in them. Conquering means walking in them till the day that I die or that he returns. So if I conquer, if we conquer, then he will, according to the, the letter, give authority over the nations. And we're going to get into that deeply as we get more into the Revelation study, but the simple idea is that if we walk in faithfulness and work the purposes that he's given us, we will have authority for a time, for a a time with Jesus. Not just we, but the church, the body of of Christ generationally has authority in in a time. That's a whole sermon and we'll get into it later. And then verse uh, the, the, the end of this, he says, I, I will make you the morning star. Re- Revelation twenty two sixteen tells us Jesus is the morning star. Jesus is the morning star. So it says here, uh, if you, if you conquer, uh, I will give you the, I will give him the morning star. It's the presence of Jesus. It's the gift of being in his presence. And to all of this, just like Jesus, just like the rabbi that he is in this moment, we, we, we see the Nazarene, yeah, burnished bronze, flaming eyes. We see the Nazarene, the rabbi say, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. Go back and look at his teaching in the gospel. He says it all the time. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. I was wondering today, as we wrap our time up, you think about the church of Thyatira and you think about the sin of tolerance of false teaching. Has false teaching crept into your life? What are you willing to tolerate that is opposed to the scripture for your own comfort, your own good? That's the big question when you you walk through Thyatira. And you got to wrestle with it. Church, 21st century American church, we got to wrestle with that. As we move forward, you you really can't embrace false teaching and follow Jesus. You know, any false teaching, it sources Satan and it always bears satanic fruit. It's always wrecking at the end. It looks like freedom, but it always brings oppression (laughs) spiritually. So evaluate, pray. Would you bow your head and close your eyes? And just ask the Lord to speak to you in that way.
Jesus, I thank you for my brothers and sisters, my family, my friends. I'm thankful that we're able to gather in this place and open your word and read a letter, a message from you to a particular church. And we know that you know us just as well as you know the church at Thyatira. I often wonder what, if you wrote us a letter, what would it say? God, we so desire to walk in your truth and grace by your spirit. And so, Father, protect us from false teaching. Help us to recognize it, Father. If there is tolerance of false teaching in our life, Lord, help us to to repent of it. Even if it's if it's just compromising to to bring comfort or ease, Father, would you reveal those things to us? Father, as a church, would you keep us from false teaching? Would you keep us on the narrow path? Father, would you help us to be committed deeply to the very words of God? In every way from reading the scripture on our own on a daily basis to coming here together and opening, opening the scriptures and, and exploring deeply what it, what it meant and what it means. Guide us by your spirit in that way. Help us to understand. Give us ears to hear. We pray in Christ's name. Amen.